Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to our Swoonworthy podcast. My sister Kayla and I are thrilled to be discussing Downton Abbey today. It's an incredible six season series that garnered a huge fan base back in 2010 when it aired on ITV for the UK and then on PBS for the US. And we have a lot to talk about from the intricate storylines to the lush costumes worn by the upstairs characters not to mention the funny situations and humor provided by the downstairs characters. Kayla, what do you think makes Downton Abbey so popular? Oh, wow. That's very, that's a big question to answer. So I do have a theory about this because, you know, there's some shows you think off the top of your head that, um, you know, they were really popular when they first came out and they had so many people talking about them. One other than Downton is, you know, Friends. Um, And I have a theory about these shows. I think that they are so popular because they kind of have a very like cozy feeling to them when you watch them, you know, they're very like, you know, warming and, and calming and, and like, there's been studies done on people who watch friends and apparently it like reduces stress. And I think Downton is also, even though it's kind of dramatic at times, it's definitely got like a cozy vibe to it because they're in a big house all together there's big fireplaces, you know, it's got a mm-hmm. warm tones and coloring to it. So I think that's a big reason. Like when you watch it, you're kind of, you feel comfort. Like you feel like almost you're in, like you're in the house with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you're invited in to their house. No, I get that. I feel the same way. Like every time I rewatch this series, I just, yeah, feel warm and cozy inside. And it's funny that you mentioned Friends because I was thinking of how back when Friends was was being aired, they called it, you know, the cast was lightning in a bottle. That was a phrase they often refer to it as, you know, the cast was just spectacular. They worked well together. I think that's the same for Downton Abbey. I feel like the cast is spot on. It's perfect. I would also say lightning in a bottle with Downton Abbey cast, the, both the upstairs and the downstairs. But okay, so let's, <laughs> that's so funny. So let's talk about the family. So upstairs cast. We have the Crawley family living at Downton Abbey, and the setting is a real place, High Clare Castle. I follow them on Instagram. It's really cool to see what goes on at, at the castle nowadays <laughs> at Downton. And we have this family who, you know, right from the very beginning, we're getting some of the drama that you were talking about. Because right at the episode one, we learn that the Titanic has sunk. <laughs> it's 1912. They're heirs to the title because the The daughters cannot inherit the estate. You know, the heirs have passed away in the Titanic sinking. So it's, it's pretty, you know, it sets you right there in a specific time period right away. The cast is great. Hugh Bonville as Robert Crawley, Earl of Grantham. Elizabeth McGovern as Cora Crawley, Countess of Grantham. Their three daughters, Michelle Dockery as Lady Mary, Laura Carmichael as Lady Edith, and Jessica Brown Finley as Lady Sybil, you have to just, you know, we have to talk about Dame Maggie Smith as the Dowager Countess of Grantham or Violet Crawley. You get the family dynamics, you know, there, there's always going to be struggle with keeping the estate running throughout the series, but even in the beginning, you learn sort of, they've got to keep Downton Abbey afloat. And the way they do this is really, you got to credit the downstairs characters with keeping Downton Abbey, you know, in ship shape. (laughs) Um, I love, love, love Jim Carter as Mr. Carson, the butler. I think he's one of my favorite characters of the whole thing. He just plays that part so perfectly. And he's, I love it because he's actually one of the more proud. He's sometimes more proud and, you know, a stickler for rules and traditions than Then the upstairs cast. So, and then we have Brendan Coyle as Mr. Bates, (laughs) Phyllis Logan as Mrs. Hughes, Sophie McShira as Daisy. Can't not talk about Robert James Collier as Thomas Barrow and his partner in crime at the beginning, Siobhan Funeran. I may be pronouncing that name correctly. Let's hope so. As Sarah O'Brien or O'Brien. Oh my gosh, those two are just too much. Like, the conniving, they, they just cannot help themselves. It's hilarious. No. First couple seasons, they, it's just like, yeah. oh gosh, here they go again. Like- <laughs> Constantly meddling, but it's so fun to watch. And then I also love Anna. So 
Joanne Froggett. And she, so she has received three Emmy nominations for her role as Anna and she won a Golden Globe. And I just love that. And it kind of parallels. So the upstairs crew, Dame Maggie Smith won, she won three Emmys for playing the Dowager Countess and won Golden Globe. So it's an award-winning show. And I think it's, it's spectacular. And, and the list goes on. Like, I'm not even going to be able to mention all of the cast because there's so many throughout the six seasons. Did this show start out with like a low budget? Cause, or is PBS a big time thing? Cause I feel like, I feel like it wasn't expected to be so popular. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you can see the, the quality and the, um, the budget probably grew throughout, but from the get go, I mean, the costumes are they did, they spared no expense with the costumes and the setting. Um, I think there was a lot of faith in the creator. So it's written and created by Julian Fellows and uh, Julian Fellows, he won a best screenplay Oscar for Gosford Park in 2001. And that's a very similar movie. It has the upstairs downstairs. So I think there was a lot of faith um, but I'm sure they didn't expect it to blow up as big as it did. Like there are people who don't love period dramas as much as we do, who like Downton Abbey. Yeah, that's awesome. Maybe it got a lot more people interested in period dramas. Yeah, I think so. I mentioned the costumes just a moment ago. There are four costume designers throughout the six seasons. They they worked on different seasons. Some of them, Susanna Buxton, Rosalind Ebert, Carolyn McCall, and Anna Robbins. You know, I just love that, uh, uh, coupled with the hairstyling in the show. Lady Mary and Lady Edith and Lady Sybil have some amazing costumes. I just, I can't wait. We got to talk about the costumes before you even get into too much of the storyline. So color schemes, I want to mention that real fast. Mary, Lady Mary is always wearing the deep red, sometimes some dark blues. Yeah, I think Lady Mary, I feel like she wears red mostly in the beginning seasons and then towards the end it's like more of a dark blue I want to say yes and then Lady Edith wears a lot of golds and orange and coppers and like kind of a coral Mm -hmm. color Mm -hmm. and then we have Lady Sybil wearing some light blues maybe some light greens it's very pretty and then we're we're gonna talk about Sybil (laughs) you know, more in detail in a moment, but then we have, okay, Lady Rose. So Lily James comes into Downton Abbey and at the end of season three, love Lily James. This is when we first start to see her on the screen for anything. And now she's just really super popular, but her color scheme is like, kind of like Rose, think Rose, like light pinks, but she also wears some blues, Cora and Violet wear purples, both of them. It's just, I don't know. I love the themes of the color you know, the costume colors. I want to say that Edith, Edith's costumes are my favorite. Like her dress, really? like her clothes, everything. Yeah. For some, I think maybe the colors I'm more attracted to warmer colors, I guess, mm-hmm. like, and not so much red, honestly. So what about you though? I uh, see I'm, so would you say you're team Edith? Yes. So I'm team Mary. I just love Mary and I love the red. Red is one of my favorite colors. I just, it just kind of goes with us, Kayla. I think this is just kind of our. Oh, are they, are there really teams? Like people are divided about this. I didn't know that. Yes. No, it's true. Often when I post these characters on my at period drama style Instagram, people are commenting that they're team Mary, team Edith. I mean, everyone's team Sybil because she's just, you can't go wrong with her. But I think there's, because in the show, Mary and Edith are constantly at odds they're constantly fighting and they're not really the best of sisters. They're, they're enemies throughout most of it. <laughs> um, people choose sides. Yeah. I feel like this kind of reminds me of team cat, team dog. I think that if you're, okay. if you're team cat, you're probably team Edith, but you're also team dog. So you also like Mary, but people who only like Mary, they don't like cats. <laughs> I see. Okay. I think that there's a certain person who roots for Mary and it's the same people who I'm included in this. They're rooting for Scarlett O'Hara and gone with the wind. They're rooting for Blair Waldorf and gossip girl. It's there's something about it. Like, you know, that these characters can be horrible sisters, horrible friends, selfish, rude, but there's something about them. Something, I don't know if it's just like the glamor or the confidence. I don't know. I'm, I'm team Mary. The charisma. 
Yeah. But I love, I don't not love Edith. I mean, I don't like Edith in season one, but her growth through the series is fantastic. And in the end she gets, I mean, the, they end the series with her wedding. She's the one who outranks her sister in the end becomes a Marchioness. So I don't know. I don't like both of them in the first season, honestly. I mean, Mary's okay. is just kind of, they're both so mean to each other and it's just sad, you know, but, um, but yeah, I think they both have great character development. They do. Yeah, no, you and I are more like, we like little women and we like the Bennett sisters where they're more loving towards each other, I think. And that's why Sybil comes across as so sweet. She, I mean, she loves both of her sisters. Oh, I love Sybil. I'm rewatching the show and I just watched, you know, the scene where we have to say goodbye to Sybil and it was, it's just so traumatizing. Like they're all there and they all see it. Oh, it breaks your heart. I have to admit, I skip over that episode when I rewatch Downton Abbey because it's just, it takes too much out of me. If you want a good cry, which <laughs> honestly does feel good sometimes, just watch that scene. Oh my gosh. It's killer. And it's season three, episode five. So we only get Sybil for less than three seasons because she partially, you know, part of the time she's in Ireland too with her chauffeur turned gentleman. Tom Branson, husband. Um, and I, do you, so what do you think? Do you like Tom Branson? Oh, I do. I think he's very handsome. He, I think he's swim worthy, honestly. I, I know. I love him. I love when in season one, Sybil is starting to, you know, go against the societal norms. She wears the pants instead of the, the flowing dress. I love that and blue outfit. That's beautiful. It's so beautiful. And, you know, has the headband and it's just very, comfortable looking actually too. <laughs> I love getting all the, re- looking at all of their reactions to her outfit. And then you see Tom Branson just peek outside the window. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That part is so funny. He's like, that makes me laugh. It's like, how does he know <laughs> to like, look at that exact moment? <laughs> I don't know, but it's adorable. So I'm going to just go with it. And you also have Sybil. So she's, you know, making friends with the chauffeur, but she also makes friends with the maid, Gwen, and helps her to become a secretary, learn how to type. I love that storyline. Yeah, Sybil's got such a kind heart and such a shame we had to say goodbye to her. Her and Matthew, I'm so sad they had to leave. I know. Okay, so let's talk about Matthew. So <laughs> so we learn in the very beginning that Downton Abbey is not going to go to who they thought it was going to be the heir. It goes to this distant cousin, cousin Matthew Crawley, joins the the crew and he brings his mother, Isabel, played by Penelope Wilton. Of course, Dan Stevens plays Matthew Crawley. The two of them, you know, they're more humble. They have humble backgrounds. And so they're kind of at odds with the family and how much they spend and how much, you know, pomp and circumstance there, there is, but they, they end up assimilating a bit. Dan Stevens as Matthew Crawley. I feel like Matthew and Isabel, they're like, especially Isabel, she's just like such a humble and she just adds to the family. You know, she's kind of crisp and fresh and the summary and she's got just a nice vibe to her and I think she just she's always got that extra flavor to add to the to the family <laughs> sandwich okay I see I mean I love her I think she you know challenges them and especially the Dowager Countess played by Maggie Smith so you know whether it's you know modernizing the hospital or accepting someone from downstairs into their their upstairs crew I mean I do love her, but she does get, she does kind of, you know, annoy me at times, her character, yeah, I mean, Isabel. Sometimes, sometimes you're just not in the mood for her. And sometimes you have to not experience her, her added flavor, you know, all the time, but. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Her moral high ground. So I actually saved a quote because I love the, you know, back and forth between Lady Violet and cousin Isabel. So Dame Maggie Smith and Penelope Wilton. I love the back and forth. They're they're kind of like frenemies. I mean, they they love each other in the end, but they're constantly at odds. And here's a quote, okay? So Violet says, can't you even offer help without sounding like a trumpeter on the peak of the moral high ground? And then cousin Isabel says, must you always sound like the sister of Marie Antoinette? To which Lady Violet replies, the queen of Naples was a stalwart figure. I take it as a compliment. <laughs> 
So I don't know. I just think that it, that embodies like their relationship so well. <laughs> that, I quotes. love their dynamic. It's so funny. And Lady Violet, she's just hilarious in the show. So we, we did digress though from Matthew Crawley, cousin Matthew. I mean, in the beginning, you know, he doesn't exactly fit in. And you think there's that horrible time where he goes to, to see the churches with Edith and she's trying too hard and it's just hard to watch. He, he's already just smitten with Lady Mary from the beginning. <laughs> I didn't just eye roll just then. You did eye roll. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, you need, I don't know. They're just a, they're a great blend. And, and he helps her with this growth, this, you know, her journey to become a better person it's really you got to give it up to Matthew for that I know it's like what Mary Lady Mary said later after she you know was alone and Matthew had left she said that he softened her and yeah he just changed her completely and and now that he when he left she said that she feels like she is no longer that way and she's just not herself you know so yeah it takes her a while to to get over that. And it takes a while for us to get over that. So ugh, I just, I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> I get so upset. Matthew and Mary's love story does not start out, you know, easy. I love episode three of season one, where Mary's surrounded by all these suitors. I mean, you have Evelyn Napier, his Turkish friend, Kamal Pamuk, played by Theo James, one of his first roles. And this is so fun. Like some people forget that this is Theo James, who's more popular now. Um, he was, he was Kamal Pamuk who dies in her bed. Um, <laughs> and then you have, you know, Matthew there and they're all kind of standing around Lady Mary. She's got her pick of, pick of the litter, you know, who she wants to end up with. And then, you know, things happen and it isn't until the end of season two, that Christmas special. I love, this is probably one of my favorite episodes, the Christmas special at the end of season two. And Matthew proposes in the snow. She's wearing a beautiful red dress, dark burgundy dress. Of course, she doesn't have a coat on. She's probably freezing in the snow. Um, except that, you know, you never know what time of the year they're actually filming. And so much happens outside of the proposal in that episode. This is why it's my favorite. You have the scene where Mr. Barrow hides the dog Isis in the shed because he's trying to, <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to, you know, make a good impression on and save the dog for, <laughs> for Lord Grantham. I mean, that's oh, hilarious. Poor guy. He's just so desperate to <laughs> I felt so sorry for him and it's just funny sometimes him oh and, that's so funny and when him and O'Brien are like no longer friends and it's just Ugh. constant back and forth between them like they're trying to undermine the other it's just it's almost comical like oh yeah <laughs> wait but I, I have to finish because so much happens in the Christmas special end of season two the servants use a Ouija board Daisy just believes that you know William her William has you know talked to her about becoming a daughter-in-law to his father. I mean, there's the servant's ball and Mr. Barrow ends up dancing with Violet. <laughs> I think that's like fun. I don't know. Oh, Matthew punches Carlisle. Edith gets back with Strawlin, but we're not gonna really talk about Anthony Strawlin too much. He's not my favorite for Edith. Um, but yeah, so the Christmas special end of season two, my one of my favorite episodes, hands down. Speaking of Daisy and William, what is your opinion about William and how Daisy treated him. Daisy, oh Daisy. <laughs> she's so frustrating at times because she never knows who's good for her. She's always, you know, thinking this person is who she wants to end up with and it's the complete wrong choice for her. She should have just opened up to William a little bit more. I mean, I still think it's sweet because it's kind of like William passed and like his father wasn't totally alone because he had Daisy as a child in the end. And then at the very end, there's that other footman. What is it? Andy? They kind of hit it off in the end. So she kind of gets someone in the end, but I don't know. Does Daisy really deserve someone? She's just so frustrating sometimes. Yeah. I mean, she does get better, but yeah, she is. She does treat William poorly, I think. And Oh yeah. I do, however, love Mrs. Patmore. I think she is so funny. She's just holding down the fort in the kitchen all the time, working her butt off and the back and forth between her and Daisy is always enjoyable. Yeah. And that one episode where she thought that one guy was interested in oh, her. Oh, yeah. It's so sad. She, everyone deserves love and he just wanted her food. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Apparently she's a very good cook. I love how in the end, Mr. Carson and Mrs. Hughes end up together. It's so sweet. And I think that was a good choice. Like, like you said, everyone deserves to be with someone if it makes them happy. Um, and they kind of hinted throughout the whole show, all the seasons that kind of, that they cared for each other and yeah. they kind of had their little smiles, like when they could tell the other one was, you know, mm -hmm. you know, being sincere about them. Yeah. And they got to like, you know, drink some port in the stud, you know, in their little office together after everyone's gone to bed or, or we're still working. <laughs> okay. What do you think about Mr. Bates and Anna? Are you... Oh my gosh, I would I would argue it's the greatest romance of the whole series and it's just so their whole romance is very swoon worthy and it's just I know they're so sweet together I love them and they have the worst luck like both of them end up in prison at one point for for murder I mean it's just terrible you know, this couple lives below a big house out in the country or whatever and they managed to get in these crazy scenarios <laughs> like <laughs> It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And I, you know, I wish they had a little, a little more <laughs> happiness, but you know, they overcome it. Speaking of them being, you know, romantic and you mentioned like swoon worthy romance. So now when I go back and watch it, I notice they kind of have a theme song. So the Downton Abbey music is beautiful written by Scottish composer, John Lunn. And this melody appears throughout all seasons and in the movies, the later movies, Bates and Anna have their own like sweet theme song whenever they're overcoming these obstacles. And I think that it's really nice when you start to notice that it kind of reminds me of in Star Wars, Leia's theme. I don't know. Maybe I'm, you know, getting a little off topic here, but um, it's just sweet. Of the upstairs characters, what is your favorite couple from the upstairs characters? Of the upstairs characters, I mean, I got to go with Matthew and, and Mary. Their love is a love of, of um a love for the ages. A love for the ages. <laughs> but I like Sybil and Branson as well. He ends up becoming oh, I love how Branson ends up becoming a brother to Lady Mary and Lady Edith. I think that is such a fun friendship, sibling, you know, kind of dynamic that you couldn't have anticipated. Yeah, I'm so glad that he didn't they didn't you know write him off too yeah we really didn't focus too much on specific costuming just the color themes so far do you have a favorite costume of lady mary of edith wow okay so my favorite costume in the entire show i definitely have one and it's the dress that lady edith wore when she was having dinner with michael gregson in london and they're that fancy restaurant and she's walking in all elegantly and mm -hmm. in her, I feel like she's in her prime mm -hmm. him. I, oh, I love him with, for her. Like there's, he's pretty, he's pretty swim worthy. I would have to say. And she's wearing that dress that has the, um, halter top and it's got the gold kind of like peacock. Music. It's very peacock. Yeah. Very peacocky. And you can tell she's just feeling more confident about herself. Mm -hmm. And just got that sling wrap around the, the hip area. It's mm -hmm. kind of, and she's got the white gloves. Oh, she's beautiful in that scene. Yeah, it's got the drop waist. And like you said, like a something wrapped around. And then the halter. Yeah, no, everything you said. It really is glamorous for Edith. And I love her in that. So Carly, what is your favorite costume in the whole series? I'm not as definitive as you. I like so many of them. So I do love some of Edith's costumes you know, sometimes she wears some pretty gold ones. I do love the one you mentioned too. Um, I love her wedding dress. I think her wedding dress might be my favorite. As far as Lady Mary goes, I mean, I love all of her red ones. There's like a silky red one she wears in the beginning. Um, her Christmas proposal dress, or it's near Christmas time and um, sort of like the scalloped layers to that skirt. I just love it. And then she wears a red Delphos gown. So I don't know if you know about the Delphos, Delphos gown. So it was a dress that was inspired by like a Greek statue, the Delphi statue. And this husband and wife team created this gown. They called it like the Fortuny gown. And it's famous for its unique patented pleating technique. We're in twenties a little bit, but very, but more elevated. So she wears a red one in the Downton Abbey series finale, and then she wears a brilliant blue one in the Downton Abbey movie. 
So to me, that's one of my favorites um, of Lady Mary. And then also because she wears so much red, I think it really stands out when she goes, I think it might even, there's a chance it's even the same restaurant in London. She goes and she meets husband number two, Matthew Good, before they're married in London. And she's wearing a teal turquoise outfit with gold. So to me, that's a standout costume because she's usually wearing red. So to see her in a, in a brighter, you know, teal, she just looks beautiful and sophisticated in that one. Ooh, yeah, that one is pretty. She's got the gold headband. Yeah, I mean, her, that both, I looked at both those, those mm-hmm. dresses you mentioned. I still got to go with Lady, Lady Edith. I think she's got, okay. she's got the gams. She's got the what? She's got the gams. What is that? 20 slang, Carly. Go to the program. <laughs> Oh, wait. Wait. I got, got the gam. That means that they have a beautiful body, especially the legs. <laughs> That's funny. Other than Mary and Edith, I love some of Lady Rose's fashion. She sometimes, she wears, you know, a lot of flapper girl looks because she's like the young one, you know, joined the cast. She's kind of up to, up to no good in the beginning, like, like a party girl, um, for those of you who've maybe seen the Forsyth saga, she kind of reminds me of Fleur, Fleur Forsyth. Anyways, it's the season four, episode nine. So the season four finale where she's presented to the queen and her like presentation gown. I just adore it. Um, it's a very, very pale pink, some feathers. And she's escorted by Cora to be presented to the queen who wears this lovely lilac next to her. Oh, those are two of my favorite costumes, actually. And actually, Rose's wedding gown. No, Rose's wedding gown. The gold is it's to die for. And on my period drama style Instagram, it frequently wins like the polls, like Lady Rose's gold wedding gown. And I just love how the costumes change throughout the series, like in line with the passing time. So you get the post Edwardian looks at the beginning, think Titanic. You know, I think Rose on the ship in the Titanic movie, it's kind of a similar style. Oh yeah, I love post-Edwardian dresses. I feel like that's the most beautiful, like that was the peak. Can I just say that I wish I was born a hundred years before I was born. So I wish I was born <laughs> instead of 1991, 1891. Ooh. And then I could have worn that stuff. Oh, there you go. Yeah. No, I think, I agree. I think it's one of the more glamorous time periods. I do perhaps love it more than like the Victorian style, especially the hairstyles. I I don't love Victorian hairstyles as much, but yeah, I'm with you. That season two of Downton Abbey is when World War One hits. They're having to economize a bit. That's when Sybil really gets to kind of be her own person and live the way she wants to. And then we get to the Roaring Twenties. Um, The series ends in 1925. So you really get some great twenties looks, um, especially the more flapper girl looks brought to you by Lily James's character. Yeah. I mean, I love the twenties is very beautiful. It's, it's not my favorite. It's kind of got a boyish figure to it. You know, it's like, everything's kind of accentuating the hip and kind of taking away from the feminine waist, you know, Mm -hmm. but I think that the, you know, the fabrics, the colors and, Mm -hmm. and everything else, like the the jewelry and everything was the headbands yeah like everything else kind of was beautiful so it doesn't it's not my least favorite style Mm -hmm. era but yeah you like edwardian post edwardian i i get you very glamorous and and beautiful but yeah so the costumes are just a standout and and it won awards um the show won emmys for the costuming and hairstyling as well and i can't believe the show started in 2010 because i never even like heard of it until I, I didn't start watching the show till I want to say like when it ended I watched it in the time but I was in college so maybe I was just kind of I don't know yeah I was too young <laughs> at the time and it was it kind of seemed more like a show for like people more mature I guess <laughs> fair enough yeah no I remember watching it as it was coming out and I actually after season three the revelation of you know, already Lady Sybil's passed away and now Matthew Crawley's passed away. I had to take a break. I was like, I can't do this. You mentioned earlier at the very beginning of our, of our podcast discussion about, you know, some shows get a lot of hype and they're, 
people are tuning in right when it's being aired. You know, this is kind of a bold statement. I think that Downton Abbey also reminds me of The Walking Dead <laughs> because <laughs> the way they will kill off characters in a dramatic, horrible fashion is the same way I felt when I was watching The Walking Dead and they would kill off characters you loved. And it's like, it's just, it hurts. <laughs> oh my gosh. I never realized that, but they were kind of airing at the same time, right? Yeah. I think I was watching both of them kind of simultaneously. <laughs> That's so funny. That's definitely true. It's shocking and shocking. <laughs> yes. I mean, people are having like, sometimes I will post and they'll, you know, post on my Instagram and they'll say like, I stopped watching it after season three. I can't handle it after that. Yeah. I think I remember I started watching it and then you were telling me, yeah, I've, I've had to stop for now. <laughs> and then I watched it. Um, yeah. While you were taking a break. <laughs> yeah. I think we both use the phrase, like it wrecked me like that, those deaths. And I mean, there's some other crazy. Okay. I don't even want to talk about it either. You know, Anna and that whole instance with the visitor. I mean, I don't, I think they could have done without that whole that was storyline. Like so violent and she did I, not deserve that. She's the sweetest person on the show. Yeah. I think they could have done without that. Again, this is like walking dead level, like storyline um and then okay what do you think about the last season when lord grantham has his burst ulcer okay so <laughs> i remember specifically i was watching that episode with my mom i remember we just like we were horrified and like <laughs> my mouth was like on the ground like i was just like what is happening because <laughs> you think he dies like you straight it's up think he so, dies it's so bloody it's so <laughs> violent you're just horrified you're just like what am i like because you don't expect that they're no. always so calm and proper at dinner <laughs> and then all of a sudden the explosion everywhere <laughs> see what i'm saying walking dead level oh drama gosh. i wonder has anybody else mentioned that because i don't know genius. <laughs> for some reason we keep coming back to the show we love it dearly so we get over that but some of these storylines are just ugh. Do you have any other like least favorite storylines other than of course Anna's troubles? Yes. So Cora's ladies maids that she keeps getting after um, O'Brien leaves and they keep going for poor Branson after he's lost Sybil and they, one of, one of them tries to, you know, pretend like she got pregnant by him and that was weird. And then I think there was an, another one who, who's like kind of just annoying, like a teacher or something. Yes. Yeah. And, and I don't know that that storyline is just kind of annoying to me. I do want, him, <laughs> I want him to end up with someone, but. Well, he does in the movie. So we, we're not, I don't know if we wanted to get into the movie. He does end up with someone in the movie and I do like who he ends up with finally. See, I need to watch those again. It's been a minute. Um, yeah. I'm watching the show again. So after I finish that, I'm going to go on to the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I do kind of like who he ends up with. It's an actress, Tuppence Middleton, and she plays someone who's kind of related to the Crawley family. I think it, I think it works, but yeah, my least favorite, one of my least favorite storylines is the Ethel character and she's a, a maid and she gets pregnant by one of the soldiers during World War One, And, and then she has to give her baby up for adoption. I just, I don't know. I don't love that bit yeah I mean she just brings it on herself like she's so she's like so high and mighty in the beginning and man she just really it's so sad yeah no it's sad I mean I sympathize with her but I just I don't know I guess I could do without it but again I loved Rose Leslie as Gwen and her the secretary and then she comes back at a later season and she's married to a nice gentleman and she goes downstairs and talks to everyone and I don't know so there's so many good, oh, and we haven't even talked about Mr. Mosley. <laughs> what do you think about Kevin Doyle the actor who plays Joseph Mosley? He's a nice guy. He, I'm always just like, oh, Mosley, you know, like he, <laughs> he's just funny. He's definitely comic relief. Like I love the part where they're playing, is it badminton or? Yeah, a cricket, cricket. And he's like, oh, I'm, I know it. I'm, I'm so good at it. Here, I'll show you. And then he gets down to it and he does it and they're like, well. I expected as much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even his father was kind of like, oh boy. Yeah. No, Mr. Mosley is so funny when he's, when he actually gets drunk at, in Scotland and dances, like he's just comic relief. He kind of gets more steady and more less silly in the later seasons. He becomes a teacher. 
you yeah, know, that's, and that's Daisy. When, um, what's her name comes the new uh lady's yeah. name Baxter. Baxter, yeah. And I like them. I totally ship them. Like I think they're they're well suited for each other. They're friends before they even start anything. She's sweet. I mean, I think they're cool. Poor Mr. Barrow always has a hard time finding someone. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the day and age, but I just love Mr. Barrow. I mean, he, I think the show would not be, it wouldn't be Downton Abbey without Thomas Barrow. Yeah. He's the, you know, the tortured soul of the show, mm-hmm. but he's kind of, he's kind of like the anti-hero, you know? Yes. Yes, exactly. Cause you kind of root for him in the end and he does become Butler. Yeah. And O'Brien was an anti-hero as well. And, but I just still can't, I, I can never forgive her for what she did with, her ladyship soap. Her ladyship soap. I know. But I'm glad. I mean, she left and she, she, she probably, I think she left because she couldn't, she, you know, she just didn't want that hanging over her head anymore. Yeah. Know? And you see a little bit of sympathy from her when Mr. Bates is on trial and she, she does kind of like yeah. feel bad, like testifying against him. So, I mean, she has some moments, but. Well, yeah, they yeah. don't, they don't hate um, Barrow and, and Anna. They just, they don't really have anything against them. It's just they're incorruptible. Yeah. Yeah. So they have no use for them. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. How can we not talk about Dame Maggie Smith as the Dowager Countess? I mean, her quotes are iconic and, you know, award winning <laughs> basically because some of her first ones. So, what is a weekend? I mean, come on. It just sticks with you. Don't be so defeatist, dear. It's very middle class. And then at one point, Isabel says, I take that as a compliment. And then Violet says, I must have said it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They're just so funny together. Yeah. And so her character, I think she has some really great costumes as well. And I I was watching one episode towards, I think it was like the second season. And she's wearing this like purple Mm-hmm. Press and she's got this hat on and it's got these little circles like this little cluster of fabric on the hat and it got me thinking about fruit and I suddenly realized each one of the characters greatly represents a specific fruit <laughs> okay do do tell and I actually made a graphic because I was so inspired by this I think that we should reserve it for our patreon followers something they can download and look at if they follow us anyway but I'll talk about them. So Violet Crawley is grapes. And if you look at this picture of her, I have it. She looks like a grape, literally. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Crawley, apricot, because he's he's sweet, but he's also a little tart. And he's got a little yeah. rough sides to him. He's not mm-hmm. perfectly sweet, you know. And then Cora Crawley is your humble plum. And she's very soft and subtle and sweet. And then, so interestingly enough, Mary Crawley, first few seasons, she is 100% a cherry she's red she's got the red on she's tart but she's still um you know got a rich bold flavor but then later on i almost want to switch her to a blueberry oh interesting because, because she softens up a bit and she she starts wearing darker blue as we mentioned and then edith crawley she's 100 percent a fig because she is kind of hard she's got a thick skin mm-hmm. about her but once you get in there like michael gregson she's very sweet and nurturing and loving and then you got are you vibing with this do you agree with these so far oh yeah keep going i love it <laughs> sybil crawley is a pear she's very understated yet sweet uh flavor to her and she's she's just elegant like a pear no this one's very fitting i like that and then matthew crawley he's your dependable orange you know <laughs> he's your go-to guy he's strong and flavorful <laughs> And as I hinted earlier in the podcast, Isabel Crawley is your humble heirloom tomato. <laughs> okay. She's got that just the right amount of flavor and, and crunch to her when, right when you need it in the sandwich. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. I think my favorite of those, I got to go with the tomato being Isabel Crawley. I mean, but see, you're, you're kind of giving the, you know, the nice synopsis of all of these. When you think of tomato, you think like, oh, do I really want to eat this tomato right now? Like, I don't know. Well, I think, that, <laughs> I think tomato it's... represents, you know, just health. <laughs> well, she's just humble and she's, she's always there when you need her. She's like the moral compass. Yeah. I mean, I get you. No, I also love 
Lady Mary as a cherry and Sybil as a pear. Edith, you again, so your interpretation of a, I think a fig is also fitting for Edith, Kayla, but to me, a fig is not everyone's cup of tea. Exactly. So it's pretty. Yeah. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. And some people don't even notice the fig. <laughs> exactly. And, and then some people who do, they cherish it. Oh, I love figs. Yeah, you are. You are such a fig person. So that's why. Okay. No, I love this. And I think, I think it's pretty fitting. I think that's funny that you, you thought of all that. So if anybody's interested, you can follow us on Patreon and we give, you know, sometimes funny content like this out and you'll also get the videos to our podcast. Um, and let me know if you want a downstairs cast version of this. And I also left off Lady Rose. Um, oh, you did. So, yeah. But I have some ideas. So just let me know, guys, if, you, if you're interested. <laughs> okay. Well, that was a unique, <laughs> a unique take the Downton Abbey characters as fruit. (laughs) All right. Well, would Daisy be a potato? Because a quote from Daisy that I saved is someone asks her, they're about to go to London and she's going with them and she's going to work in the kitchen in London, the same as she works in the kitchen in Downton. And someone goes, are you excited? And and she goes, I'm never excited. Peeling potatoes in London is the same as peeling potatoes here. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, actually, I think that the downstairs cast I would have to represent them as vegetables instead. Yeah, there you go. Speaking of Isabel and quotes, I caught this this last time that I watched it and I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, so at a certain point, they open up the house, Downton Abbey, to people in the village to come see inside the house and marvel at, you know, what's inside. Lord Grantham's kind of against it. Of course, you know, Violet's against it. They're all kind of like, why would we do that? And why would anyone want to see the inside of Downton Abbey anyways? Isabel says, even Elizabeth Bennett wanted to see what Pemberley looked like inside. And fun fact, Penelope Wilton, the actress, played Elizabeth Bennett's aunt, Miss Gardner. And they went, it, they did the tour in Pemberley together with Keira Knightley. Yes. Oh my gosh. See, I did not, that didn't register, even though I do remember seeing her in Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. So I love that. I know. I thought that was cute. Very cute. Yeah. Little connection there. And then another kind of, you know, connection. I don't know if you've seen the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. It is such a comfort movie, a feel good movie on Netflix starring Lily James and Penelope Wilton is in it. And Jessica Brown Finley is in it. So you've got Cousin Isabel, Lady Sybil, and... Lady Rose in this movie and it's on Netflix. Wait, what's it called again? The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. <laughs> it's also a book, a, a very wonderful book. Um, but this is like a comfort movie for me. And Lily James is the star. And it kind of has some Downton cast members in it. So I want to see that. We talked a lot about Lady Mary and Lady Edith in the beginning of the series, but let's we didn't even talk about who they end up with in the end. So Lady Mary ends up with Henry Talbot played by Matthew Good. And I know some people are like, you know, I can't have anyone with Mary other than Matthew, but if they were going to get someone and they, they got Matthew Good and he is just like such a wonderful British charming man actor. I just, I love him. He's actually one of my favorites in, I just, I find him totally charming. I always remember him in Chasing Liberty. (laughs) <laughs> I always love him when I was a kid and or yeah. Yeah, he's in he's in a lot of things and he's just very good. <laughs> he is Matthew good. And if anyone could, you know, come in there and be a suitable second husband for Mary, I think that was the right choice. And then Edith ends up with Harry Haddon Patton, actor who plays Birdie Pelham. What do you think about her relationship, Lady Edith, with Birdie? I just want her to be happy. <laughs> Well, I know everyone does, right? Because, <laughs> you know, middle child syndrome. And I feel like throughout the whole series, it's just so blatant. They're just like ignoring her. They're just like, whatever she's interested in, they're like, they just say something negative about it, you know? And it's just. But she makes a life for herself in London. She's actually the most successful independent of them. You know, Sybil know. would have been too, but. I know, but that's the whole point about the middle child. Is like, <laughs> that can be true, but at the end of the day, it's like nobody even cares. <laughs> I know it's all about Mary, Mary, this, Mary, that. Oh, look at all the suitors Mary has. <laughs> okay. But again, she out in, in the end, Edith outranks her sister. 
she marries the seventh Marquess of Hexham. She becomes a marchioness. It's just, I don't know. It's great. I like her happy ending, her fairy tale ending. She looks beautiful in her wedding gown. She gets her daughter, Marigold, to stay with them and everyone accepts her. I love that name, Marigold. I do too. It's pretty. And then the other kids' names, what, uh, Sibby. Sibby, that's so cute. <laughs> that's cute for um, Tom Branson's daughter with Sybil. And then was it George, Lady Mary has? Yeah, George. George from Matthew and her relationship. So I'm surprised she didn't name him Matthew. Maybe it was just, it would be too hard. Like if you heard that over and over again, I would, ugh, I still can't even believe. And in that scene. Oh, that scene is just terrible. And like, they zoom in. They zoom in on his, it's so, it's so, and the way that they don't even address it like immediately after, it's just so no, like. cut you off. That was a season finale. But then when they come back and it's like, they don't even, they brush it over. They don't even talk about it. It's just, tragic. it's so cold. It's like, oh my gosh. And then uh, when I mean, he's. Mary's like, dealing with it, but they, yeah, like they don't like. Ugh, it's when he's terrible. laying there in the blood, ugh, it's brutal. Never getting over that. And <laughs> still, <laughs> as as our listeners can tell, we're we're still affected by that. Mary has the baby, and she's just oh, yes. She's, she's talking, and she's like, "Oh, I can't wait till later." And she's holding the baby, and then it flashes back to oh. freaking Matt, uh, Matthew driving like a bat out of hell. And he's and like, the music's the music is like, like Why are you driving so fast, sir. Oh my god. Oh. And then the next scene, he's just laying there and she's like, oh, yes, I'll have to tell Matthew. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, this is terrible. It's it's the worst. It's the worst. And I I don't like it. I think they the actors decided to do other things after Downton both. Well, yeah, they wanted they both wanted to do other things. We're nearing the end of our podcast. I have to talk about a series by the same creator, Julian Fellows, that's going on right now. It's called The Gilded Age. And it's set in New York City and Newport, Rhode Island. And it's 30 years before the start of Downton. Okay. The Gilded Age. So you're getting the wealthy and elite of New York City, the Americans. And you also get an upstairs, downstairs kind of feel for it. For whatever reason, the downstairs characters do not grab you like they do in Downton yet. I'm starting to kind of, you know, in season two, like one of them, but it's just, they're not, I still don't know their names. It's terrible, but I do like the Gilded Age and I'm hanging on. A lot of people are holding on for some hope here because this is 30 years before Downton. There is a rumor that it'll eventually, there will be a crossover. There will be a connection and we might see Cora before she gets married to Lord Grantham, before she becomes a Crawley, Cora might be, you know, a debutante in New York City in the oh Gilded gosh. Age. I would freaking love that. I would actually start watching that show. <laughs> yeah. And apparently this was the initial concept for the Gilded Age. It was going to be a prequel, but they ended up going a different direction and they're two different families. Um, but there's still rumors. There's still hope for a crossover. I actually like the Gilded Age season two better than the season one. I think it's ramping up. It's not quite down to Abbey, you know, in my heart, but it's, it's still enjoyable. Um, other Julian Fellows projects. So I, I mentioned Gosford Park. He won the Oscar for screenplay in 2001. He did the screenplay for the Reese Witherspoon Vanity Fair movie, 2004. He wrote the script for the young Victoria in 2009, which you and I love Kayla. Dr. Thorne is a four part mini series in 2016. That's completely enjoyable. Some other projects, Belgravia, The Chaperone starring Elizabeth McGovern. So he's, Julian Fellows is just, you know, a wonderful, wonderful Hello. creator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Matthew Good is good. And Julian Fellows is a good fellow. So I don't know. <laughs> We're getting silly here at the end of our podcast. Anything else you want to mention, Kayla? I just love the show so much. And it's definitely something I have to watch every once a year. You know, like it's it's standing the test of time for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the attention to detail, the, you know, historical accuracy with the costumes. I mean, I know that they even did work. They, they had consultants. So they even knew how the play settings would be 
placed on the dinner table. They knew the decorum and the customs and how the servants and valets and footmen would act. Yeah, it has a lot of care and um, just like Carson has a lot of care for the family. Aww. You can tell that the, the, the creators of the show put a lot of heart and care into creating it. And mm-hmm. I just love the atmosphere of it. Like, you know, the setting at the mm-hmm. house and the surrounding town. And mm-hmm. then you've got, you go inside and you get that cozy vibe like we talked about. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's just really important to shows. Like, I don't know if the guilt yeah. page really has that same quality. Maybe that's it. Maybe you, maybe you hit the nail on the head there. Maybe it's lacking some warmth and coziness. Yeah, I've just um, noticed a lot hmm. of movies and shows that I really enjoy. They have so much like the atmosphere, mm-hmm. like, you know, the surroundings. You get that feeling right away and it, and it kind of just takes you on that journey. But, and then the movies and shows that I don't like, it's like, I, it just feels like cold and there's just nothing to, there's no feeling of like being there almost. Yeah. You know? Like, it's like, you can't, relate it, you can't relate it to where you've been, you know? No, I love that. I think maybe that, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, that might be it. And, and the cast, they just, they got the perfect cast for this show. And even when some of the cast decided to leave, um, you know, they got Lily James in there and some other characters they brought in in the end. And so they did a great job. Yeah. I mean, there were so many great cast members that you lose a couple, but there's still so many <laughs> left that you love. So yeah, you keep watching it. We, I know you and I both keep watching it. Yeah. I hope everyone enjoyed this. There you have it guys. Downton Abbey will go down as one of the most widely loved and cherished period dramas of all time. Hope you enjoyed our chat. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, subscribe to us on Spotify and other podcast platforms and follow us on Patreon so you can get exclusive access to fun graphics and our videos of the podcast. And don't forget to leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to this podcast. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.